Okay, uh, let's uh, look at some of the cases. Uh, copyright uh, infringement cases involving computer programs tend to fall into two categories. One of them is literal infringement, and the second is non-literal elements of a computer program. Now, uh, the first case that uh, came up uh, right after the uh, 1976 statute went into effect in 1978, it was uh, Apple Computer versus um, uh, Franklin Computer. In that case, uh, it was uh, a literal infringement case. Uh, Apple uh, accused uh, Franklin of copying its uh, s uh, computer code. It was just about 100%. Franklin said, well, uh, you know, if you all of the uh, source code converted into uh, binaries, uh, ones and zeros, uh, no one could read a bunch of ones and zeros. Uh, the courts had little uh, trouble disposing of that argument. It's uh, a, a, a statement on a tangible medium. It could even be a sequence of ones and zeros that are uh, measured in nanometers uh, on a chip. It's still copyrightable. Okay, uh, fair enough, uh, easy enough. Uh, then uh, there was uh, another case that came up, though, which was going to test the uh, fair use defense. Under copyright law, uh, uh, people, uh, 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 a user has, uh, for example, a fair use of, uh, of certain material. Uh, I've uh, enumerated in the outline the four factors in the statute pertaining to fair use, uh, where the courts tend to look very uh, sort of like generously toward defendants if it's in an educational institution. Uh, they uh, seem to uh, look toward plaintiffs if it's uh, for profit. Uh, for example, if someone were to uh, write uh, a parody of lyrics of uh, Beatles and put it at the end of a course line, a course outline in a computer science course in a non-profit educational institution. <laughs> okay, folks, <laughs> you know, this is, believe it or not, it's a non-profit educational institution, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I know you've been paid tuition, believe me, trust me. <laughs> Don't you just hate someone who says, trust me, you just pay the money. Anyway, though, it's a non educational institution, it's at the end of a course outline, and uh, that might be a fair use. Okay, fair use uh, might go over uh, pretty well uh, in a situation like that. Uh, let's look at, uh, though, uh, how it goes over in a, uh, computer, uh, uh, a computer program copyright case. Uh, the case that uh, brought up the issue of fair use was uh, Sega versus uh, Accolade. Uh, that was a case that uh, came out of, uh, the, the case was filed uh, in San Francisco. Sega had a game and uh, they had the software that uh, was compatible with the game system. Uh, Accolade, apparently, according to some of the uh, information I've got from the case, I think that they were trying to negotiate, negotiations broke down. So what Accolade did was they uh, purchased a Sega game system on the open market and they uh, downloaded it into a computer, and then uh, they did a decompiling process. They just went from the uh, uh, ones and zeros uh, in the object code, they decompiled it into source code, and then they studied it. They did a crash program. I think that uh, it's not clear from the decision whether the source code that they produced was identical to the source code of Sega, but uh, they studied it very carefully, and then they wrote their own computer program, which was different from uh, the Sega uh, computer program. However, it was compatible with the Sega system. Uh, well, uh, Sega sued Accolade and said that there was literal infringement because what Accolade did was it copied the Sega uh, program into its computer. Now, you know, uh, if you take a computer software and program it into a computer, uh, what good can it do for you? Well, anyway, though, uh, they did uh, do the reverse engineering process, and in fact, uh, Sega said, uh, when they filed their lawsuit, we need a preliminary injunction. A preliminary injunction is a procedure where uh, if the copyright owner or the patent owner tells the judge, uh, even if we win this case at the end of a year or two, by that time the defendant has trashed my uh, software, my, has trashed my patent, uh, I need an injunction right now. Uh, we have to stop them right now. In order to get the preliminary injunction, the plaintiff has to prove two things. Number one, a likelihood of success and irreparable injury. And uh, Sega said, we will likely succeed because Accolade copied our code into their computer. And even though they uh, eventually did a decompiling and the product that they sold did not copy any lines of code, it was, uh, they did do that part, part of that procedure was copying our system. Uh, the trial judge actually uh, held for Sega and the case went up to the Court of Appeals. Uh, and the Court of Appeals uh, reversed. 
uh, the Court of Appeals held that uh, this reverse engineering process was uh, a fair use when it came to trying to design code that was perhaps compatible, a competing product. Well, that's okay. The system, that's what the system is about, developing competing products, but did not copy any lines of the Sega code. Uh, the Court of Appeals made some interesting statements, though. Uh, they observed what the uh, they made some observations about uh, copyright protection of computer programs. Computer programs are, in essence, utilitarian articles. That's not good for, uh, uh, for com copyrights. Articles that accomplish tasks such as uh, many logical, structural, and visual display elements that are dictated by the function to be performed and considerations of efficiency and by uh, external factors such as compatibility requirements. So uh, the court uh, effectively said that this is the hybrid nature of a computer program, and there's no settled standard for identifying what is uh, protectable and what is perhaps not protectable. So on that basis, though, the court said uh, reverse engineering could be fair use. And in fact, uh, some people said, well, that, that's a pretty good thing, because now you can encourage people to do reverse engineering. You're uh, promoting the progress of science and the useful arts. Uh, on that basis, uh, the uh, Court of Appeals effectively said that uh, there was, uh, that Sega did not prove likelihood of success. They didn't hold in, uh, on behalf of Sega or Acrolay, they just sent the case back for trial. That uh, case was decided by the Ninth Federal S Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, it was sitting in um, San Francisco. The Ninth Circuit uh, has federal appellate jurisdiction over nine western states in Guam. So uh, their opinion seems to uh, have a lot of, uh, at least a geographical uh, weight. Uh, let's look at um, now some of the other types of cases, a couple involving non-literal elements of uh, computer code. In order to uh, give you some idea as to uh, how, uh, thi uh, how this falls into place, uh, <coughs> uh, under copyright law, the copyright owner is entitled to exclusivity to what is known as derivative works. For example, if you were to write a novel, uh, you would, and you had the copyrights to the novel, and then uh, someone uh, were to write a screenplay based on your novel, that's considered a derivative work. If the producer of the screenplay did not have uh, authorization, the copyright owner of the novel, the producer of the screenplay might be liable for copyright infringement. Okay, now let's see how that fits when it comes to computer programs. Uh, computer uh, owners of copyrights of computer programs try to analogize this uh, derivative work concept to computer programs so that the owner of the, uh, pro, uh, the copyrights would have some exclusivity to structure, sequence, and organization. And that's what generated an awful lot of litigation. 